Okay, we're back for the noon block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Community Matters, okay, uh, with Lewis Herman. He is a professor of political science at the West Oahu campus of the University of Hawaii, but he's much, you'll see, much, much more than that. Uh, so, Lewis, you know, we're, we're talking, the title of our show, which we had to negotiate, was how COVID has revealed an inflection point in human history. Uh, it's, it's, it's an ambitious title, but I know you want to discuss it for maybe five or six hours. Let's see if we can do that in 30 minutes uh, or it. thereabouts, okay? Yeah. So I, I want to let you go, let you run with some slides, okay. and you can sort of answer that question, how yeah. COVID has revealed an inflection point in human history. Go for it. Thanks. Okay, so uh, human history's got quite a lot packed into it. So, uh, you know, we've got to have some sense of what we're talking about uh, when we talk about an inflection point or a turning point. So I want to try and cover a lot of material and images really help and a few quotes managed to sum up things very succinctly. And you know, feel free to interrupt with questions as we go. Um, so the, the, the first quote is from uh, Vaslav Havel, who was uh, the leader of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia against uh, the communist regime, eventually became president, addressed Congress 1989. And basically what he said was that we will never have an end to our crises uh, without a revolution in consciousness. And so what he's calling for is a fundamental change in the operating system of our civilization, not just Czech Czechoslovakian civilization, but global, because every country on earth is now part of a global system of industrial capitalism, representational democracy, and the template for that is the United States of America. So this is a system of organizing a global economy, nation states that emerged out of revolutions in 16th century Europe. So if we want to understand the nature of our crisis now, we really got to understand what's dysfunctional about our operating system. Basically, it's about three to 400 years out of date. It's antiquated. The vision of humanity, the earth society that the founders were operating on was understandable in the 17th century and 16th century. Uh, but no longer makes sense. We know a lot more. So that's the importance of the whole truth quest, seeking knowledge in this moment of crisis. Have we been sleeping? I mean, why do we let it get ahead of us that way? Um, the, the, so at some point along the way, people were enlightened. Uh, the great thinkers or semi-great thinkers were enlightened. Uh, but now we, we seem to have, you know, we lost track of the changes in our world. And that's why we need to have a revolution in thinking. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying that we, we need to have a revolution in our attitude to thinking. It's not like you get enlightened, then the job's done, then you can give up thinking for the next 200 years, which is basically what we did. We, we went through an enlightenment. They were the great founding philosophers, Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Adam Smith, founding fathers of the Constitution. And then we went to sleep. They put in place a system of government, clarified a set of values, said, go for it, boys and girls. And for the next 200 years, we... Rev never really seriously questioned these foundations. So the point about a revolution in consciousness is that we've got to wake up to thinking and seeking knowledge as a way of life, as a precondition for any politics. It's not something you do once and then you've done it, you've got all the answers, you have the truth, it's fixed and forever. It's a process. And what so I want even, to even assuming the revolution was the right thing, even assuming that they you know, were enlightened and they knew they knew best at the time what to do. I think what you're saying is you, you've got to keep on working at that. And we have yeah. not been keep, we have not kept on working at that. Uh, we have been distracted for many reasons. Uh, we have had, um, you know, problems that took us off the path. Uh, this is a problem because now you get to 2020 and you find that we're way behind the curve. And I think I also hear you saying that going forward, we're going to have the same problem unless we remain flexible and we update all the time. Exactly. Yeah, and, and this process of updating all the time uh, is really what we've neglected. You know, there were uh, provisions in the Constitution for amending the Constitution for change, for the Constitution growing, being a living document. And Jefferson taught about the necessity periodically to have revolutions in thought. But it's almost impossible to do that within the constraints of the bureaucratic and legalistic structure of the Constitution. We haven't been able to do this fundamental rethinking about what it needs to be human. What is the natural world? What is our relationship to the natural world? So if we could just blast through a few more 
slides summarizing our crisis and then the foundations. So that gives a sense of this turning point in consciousness, uh, creativity, beauty, art, coming into our approach to politics. And then on the left side of the image, you've got you know, the current state of politics, which is really, if you can just hold it there, a series of converging crises. Uh, for the crises, the next one, please. Next slide. So you've got a whole series, I've just listed them. I won't go through them in detail. I mentioned them last time, but starting with the climate crisis, industrialized agriculture and its connection to pandemics like COVID. The connection is not immediately obvious to most people, but this industrialized system of farming has concentrated uh, enormous populations of animals in very stressed, unhealthy conditions next to human populations. Perfect breeding ground for infectious diseases. Uh, in addition to which our industrialized system of farming is polluting waterways, polluting rivers. There's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's about 8,000 square miles of dead ocean because of the runoff from our agriculture. It goes on and on. Uh, the concluding point, why this pandemic is an inflection point, is that everything has suddenly stopped and people are confined to their homes, a lot of time on their hands, compelled to see what's on the news, and start thinking about big questions in the big picture. So it's a, a, almost a, a God-given opportunity to start rethinking everything, which is just in time. Next. Uh, so, yes. Uh, me... Tell us quickly, because it's hard to read. Yeah, well, yeah, I can't see it either. Uh, OK, so this is. <laughs> Uh, honesty and uh, integrity in professions. Uh, you can see nurses at the top. This is a Gallup poll done in 2014. It's exactly the same in 2018, which was the last time this was done. You can see, poly if you can just uh, enlarge the, the slide in some way, you can see, can you see uh, politicians at the, ba at the base? Yes. Politicians right at the bottom. So we, we've got a problem with corruption. Politicians are not trusted. Politicians are the most powerful people in our society. They make the laws which shape the economy, shape the development of society, shape how we live. So it's critical to invert this, to have politicians or leaders as the most trusted, respected, truth-loving, courageous, generous-hearted, concerned for the community. We're in a situation now where we have exactly the opposite. It's becoming self-evident increasingly to anybody who watches more than one channel of news or stays within their social media cocoon that we have a crisis in integrity. And it's not simply the United States. So why? Where does this come from? Next slide. Uh, there we have Jimmy Carter's assessment of the situation. Politics is the world's oldest profession, closely related, second oldest profession, closely related to the first, which traditionally for obscure reasons is prostitution. Uh, but it's pretty clear that money corrupts politics. That's a general accepted principle more, please. Uh, so here we have a measure of inequality. Russia was rated by Credit Suisse as the most unequal country on the planet with about 89% of the wealth owned by the top 10% of the country. It's basically a kleptocracy, a tiny elite to control the wealth of the country. The country itself is almost run like a gigantic mafia ring. Uh, and then the United States is fast catching up. 10% uh, of the population own, if you can keep the slide up, own 76% of the wealth. And all the increase in wealth in the, since 1980, since Ronald Reagan, uh, has gone to the top 1% of that top 10%. And most of it has gone to the top 0.1% of the top 10% of the top 1% of that 10%. And most of that has gone to the 0.01%. So there's incredible concentration of wealth. Globally, we have 62 private individuals who own literally half the wealth in the world. This is a situation which is, people are beginning to realize, including the wealthy, absolutely unsustainable. Why? But it's per it perpetuates itself, doesn't it? It perpetuates but, itself because of an underlying philosophy that's based on property and the freedoms of the individual to accumulate unlimited amounts of property. That is the primary moral foundation for government and for individual rights and freedoms, essentially private property. It's, it's sacrosanct. Now, what is missing, this was a great achievement when Europeans were fighting against the corruption of feudalism and the, the inability of an individual to control their private property, the king could basically assert whatever he liked. Uh, but 
it's not a basis for a society because a society also has responsibilities and obligations. There's almost nothing in the Constitution of the United States and in these philosophers about cultivating individuals with a sense of connectedness to society. You know, so as Margaret Thatcher fam famously said, there's no such thing as society. There are only individuals. We don't have a theory of society. So it's not surprising that in our world today and now politics, we see selfish individualism gone mad, epitomized in, in the apex of, of our leadership right now. But, but, but Lewis, is that possible? Is or possible? is it, or the, is the individualism, you know, for some individual survival built into the species? Can we ever do what Margaret Thatcher, you know, couldn't find? Yeah, that's why it's so important to do big history, which is part of the way forward, which is part of this revolution in consciousness that uh, Vaslav Havel was calling for, because hi big history reveals that for about 99% of human history, we actually lived, human beings were fashioned in small bands of cooperative, egalitarian, democratic, nomadic hunter-gatherers, largely peaceful because there's no point in private property. You're moving all the time. There's no hierarchy. People can just come and go as they please. Bands are voluntary. Um, and there's no need for warfare or slavery. These things begin 5,000 years ago. We locked into a bubble in our thinking of the last 5,000 years, and about 90% of us are locked into thinking about the last maybe 50 years in terms of politics. So you know, our picture of reality is massively constricted in terms of what is human nature. If you want to know what human nature is, you've got to say, what is the human? And that requires an evolutionary picture, an anthropological picture. You've got to love knowledge. There's no other way around this. But you know, it occurs to me that you, you can't motivate groups of people, however knowledgeable, to invent you know, uh, uh, enormous projects, uh, to undertake enormous projects and invent spectacular machines and software, what have you. It takes billions to make um, a given piece of uh, fabulous software. Um, and so you cannot achieve the billions without private property. Somebody has to accumulate large wealth to make large investment in large projects. Isn't it true? Of course. I, I, I'm not saying that private property isn't essential and valuable and that some degree of concentration of wealth is necessary. Whether it's in private hands or not, or how much is in private hands is another matter. So clearly there needs to be considerable freedom for the individual to display creativity and initiative in controlling what's immediately necessary. Uh, what we have is a situation where all our focus has gone on monumental products that have basically devastated much of the biosphere of the planet. And we've completely neglected the moral quality of the individual, what it takes to make a good human being, what it takes to make a good trusting, honest relationship what it takes to make a happy society where everyone is flourishing. We're not even paying attention to those questions in, in any fundamental way. So it's not- Would you I, return I, to Hawaii before the overthrow? No, it's Would not- Would you return to Hawaii as a monarchy? No, certainly not. Um, you know, because a monarchy partook of some of the distortions and deformations of medieval Europe. Um, and so, you know, clearly the monarchy itself in many ways embraced Westernization, many aspects of Westernization, and could see that there's something powerful and true and good in this expansion of Western industrial capitalism. But one sided, you know, just because one idea is good doesn't eliminate all competing moral values. You know, as Plato said, this is a really important principle no value on its own is good. Any value pursued on its own, like individual freedom or private property, becomes a supreme evil unless it's balanced with its opposite. And in our case, the opposite is caring, sharing, society, building relationships and expanding awareness. Awareness is invisible. You don't need monumental architecture for awareness. You need to activate what's above your neck. It's very simple. Everybody does it. The trouble is it's eliminated from our educational system in the service of training kids to fit into the job market. So it's again, not either or. We obviously got to function in the system. We all need jobs, but if you're not cultivating good people, and if you're not cultivating awareness of what is real, you get precisely the sort of situation that has been building in the United States for the last 300 years. And that's the catastrophe, the convergence of crises that we're facing. 
So I don't know if you want to go through some more slides that sort of puts this in a sequence and then maybe sure, let's do that. Get, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe just, okay. So how do we get into this? Just in sequence, please just go through them in sequence. How do we get into this mess? So this is the promise of a revolution in consciousness. This is waking up to consciousness, uh, self-knowledge, personal growth, primary value. It doesn't appear in our educational system. Right, it's a matter of our educational systems accumulating information that's going to be useful in changing reality in some way. Uh, second point is face to face discussion. Uh, this is a way of organizing them as a single complex self knowledge discussion, involvement in community. We've got to recognize that we ourselves couldn't function, feed ourselves, speaking language, wouldn't know English without our participation in community. So, community is fundamental. None of this means anything without weaving all our experience and all our knowledge into an increasingly large story which would reveal things like what i mentioned a little earlier that human beings are actually actually evolved to be cooperative caring sharing to have honest trusting relationships with one another if you look at the big picture if you study a bit of anthropology if you is, is, there, is there proof of that has there been a society in human history where they were caring sharing uh, in a completely cooperative collaborative community the evidence suggests that most human societies were like that for most of human history. I mean, we can't go back in time. There were no books during a hunting gathering phase, but we lived as hunter gatherers and we've got models for how hunter gatherers lived from surviving hunter gatherers like the son Bushman, uh, of, of whom I've made a detailed study, uh, published a book about it, Future Primal, uh, which examines in detail the connection between contemporary hunting gathering societies and the evidence for the nature of human society before there were books, before there was written history, uh, roughly for the last 100,000 years, nine tenths of human history. And all the evidence overwhelmingly is that these bands had no reason, there's no evidence why they would accumulate property. If you're nomadic, you've got to carry it with you. <laughs> you know, what are you gonna carry this big, beautiful rock that you found? Uh, you know, you, you, you're living in a completely different reality where uh, the, the wealth is encoded in your experience and in your stories and in your relationships and in the shared history of the community. That's the what we've the, I mean, This may have been a wonderful time, um, you know, at one with nature, uh, close relationships in the, in the tribal group and all that. But as I mentioned to you when we spoke the last time, you, you can't build uh, dentists that way. Um, and your life expectancy was about 26 years. Um, sure. So is that, we're willing to trade that, do you think? Yeah, it's not a trade, Jay. Again, it's not either or, it's both and more. That's the point, and that's the value of consciousness, because you can understand that, you know, we have all this genius technology, uh, but we are choking on our technology, and our technology is poisoning and destroying us. It's destroying the biosphere. We've dumped, by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the world's oceans than there will be biomass of fish. That's a product of technology and our genius wealth. It's not a good thing. We're not going to survive that. We're over. Forget the human venture if that happens. So we've got to wake up and mobilize this, which we've ignored uh, increasingly for the last few hundred years. Well, don't you think a lot of this has to do with the number of people that have um, propagated on the planet? I Again, mean, if we have eight point something billion people on the planet, that puts a lot of pressure on things. Right. If we go back to one billion or two billion, life would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Sure, but don't forget, you know, we had one billion not so long ago. And uh, we had one billion locked into a growth model, and the growth models produced the situation. So it's no good just going back to numbers. Again, it's what's guiding people's behavior that you've got to look at. Could so this work at, at eight billion? Could it work? It would work better. I mean, we could it, right now. Everything will work better if we start introducing a concern with human flourishing, as opposed to producing material wealth and concentrating that wealth in the hands of an, an increasingly shrinking elite. It makes absolutely no sense. It's guaranteed civilizational suicide. We have to pull back from the abyss or we're gonna go spiraling down into chaos, which we're on the, the point of doing. This is the inflection point. This is the knife edge. Do you so, wanna- We have to develop better consciousness about these principles and yeah. these values. Um, but there are 8 billion of us. And how do you get all 8 billion or at least a, a critical mass of them um, to buy in, to agree? Well, to, yeah, okay. To reach so, awareness. Okay, so uh, you do what you can with what you have. I'm starting off with Jay Fidel and Think Tech and my students. You know, there is this, this, this new culture is emerging. It's emerging at the grassroots. 
it's emerging. I participated in the pro protests a couple of weeks ago at the Capitol. Uh, these new values are surfacing in the new youth culture in many aspects of it. There's a regression to the old values, doubling down, getting even harder and more brutal and more cruel and more violent, uh, trying to hold on to the old model, which is essentially this West European model of you know, technological and material dominance, individualism, competition, uh, and a sort of a religious fundamentalism. We need to go back to uh, recognizing the sacredness of all living creatures, that all living creatures emerge from a living earth, and that the primary moral imperative is to wake up to the sacredness of nature, the earth, and all living creatures. When we do that, everything falls back into place. And we have models, I don't know if you want to flash up some slides, uh, just race through the liberal slides. You know, this is the big picture of human history. And you can see that we've lived as hunter-gatherers for nine tenths, that big column on the left. Industrial society barely registers. And that is the big flip over. Something happened in the 16th century. Next. That's what happened in the 16th century. Everything exploded. Population, energy, uh, information, number of scientific journals, mobility, three revolutions, science, capitalism, the reformation, uh, the basic values underlying all three converged into liberalism, the political philosophy of liberalism, which is our operating system. Uh, it was a genius move in the 17th century. It's about 300 years out of date. It's antiquated and it's leading us over the edge. Next. Classical liberalism, it basically globalized selfishness, greed, and materialism, uh, along with inequality, individualism. Next. Uh, so here we get the foundations, Descartes, foundation of science, essentially materialism. Nothing is real unless you can measure it. Science is only concerned with material reality in the external world. Doesn't deal with inner experience. Next. Uh, John Locke, uh, nature has no meaning or value until converted by human labor into valuable property. So here we get an, an attitude to nature and an attitude to property as the foundation of society. Next, more. Uh, there we go, Thomas Hobbes, human nature is basically selfish, aggressive, acquisitive, state of nature is an endless war of all, all, uh, of all against all. This is a description of our society today because our society was built on these assumptions. That's what we don't realize. The founding fathers who wrote the constitution took this as gospel. This was accepted certainty about human nature. We now know it's wrong. It's simply not true. This is not the way most human beings behave. Next. Well, it's not sustainable. And, um, and what, what you know what I want to ask you um, we have a few minutes left is is um, you're you're a political scientist and, and you're focused on how we manage ourselves how we manage all those eight billion people um, and and we, uh, going back to the beginning of our discussion we seem to have lost touch with the best way to manage them not only the philosophy but the best way to manage the people consistent with the philosophy. Right. So right now we have um, what I would call a failing democratic state here. And to the extent the U.S. fails, other democratic pretenders will also fail. Um, so we have a big problem. It's an inflection point for sure. But query, what is the political system that would, that would work uh, to achieve what you're talking about, this level of awareness uh, and uh, harmony? Yeah, okay. So, so what we need to do as much as possible is decentralized decision making empower local communities. So it's a, it's a model of decentralization, empowering neighborhood boards. But the most important thing is education, because without this expansion of consciousness, no bureaucratic structure of government, no new constitution is going to do any good, as we've seen with our constitution. Our constitution has led to the rise of fascism in the United States, to uh, um, an incipient autocracy, uh, something approaching a dictatorship that makes America look more like a banana republic, uh, um, the dictatorships of, of Eastern Europe. We're moving in the wrong direction. So the point is not to dream up some complex bureaucracy by which to make decisions. The point is for ordinary people at the grassroots level to wake up and take control as much as possible of the political process, as much as possible. Whatever is accessible to you, vote, but educate yourself first. Run for office but educate yourself first, educate yourself second, educate yourself forever. Don't stop because we don't know what we're doing as a society. Lifelong education. 
Sorry? And maybe, and maybe one of the problems over the past uh, 300 years is that we haven't done lifelong education. We have, we have formalized education into schools and we've stopped after school. Right. And, and the, the education that follows is really not, not robust. Yeah. But, but the problem I see in education, and maybe you can help me with this, is that if, if I make an initiative to educate every, every young person uh, born in this world, to teach them exactly what you're saying, what's on your slides, what, what the great thinkers have, have allowed for us, um, it's gonna take a generation or two or three before those individuals better educated can get into a position in the human scheme of things to actually make the change. And do we have, this is an important question, do we have enough time to wait for them to get in that position no as better educated? No waiting. We have no time to wait. This is all hands on deck. This is a, a global emergency. Everybody needs to wake up as soon as possible, do what they can with what they have, because we're going over the edge of the abyss. We have at most 10 years to turn the whole thing around. In my estimation, looking at climate change, species extinction, uh, the crisis in food production, uh, pandemics. This is just the, the first taste of what is to come because the system that generated this is still in place and people haven't really grasped what the deep causes of the rise, sudden rise of infectious diseases are, the connection to industrialized agriculture. The Department of Agriculture has just been taken over by the biggest villains. Trump has just appointed the people who are responsible for this benefiting from the system of agriculture, which has absolutely no future. I might add at this point that West Oahu is pioneering a system of sustainable community-based agriculture, which can feed everyone sustainably into the indefinite future. So we're starting to do this at UH West Oahu, where we're introducing into our mission the, the vision of lifelong learning, of integrating life experience, of integrating the first person, integrating interdisciplinary big picture thinking, uh, we're doing what we can with what we have, but this is a—it's a global imperative at all levels of society. In every, in every, it's a global region. task, also. And so I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, one of those little quotes you see at the bottom of some people in their email. Uh, the one, one that's common is um, a few determined um, individuals can change the world. Or words to that effect. Exactly. And what yeah. I hear you saying is that yes, it's in West Oahu. Yes, it's here on Think Tech. Yes, it's 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 you. Um, but query, how do you reach the 8 billion or those who are influential enough to turn yeah, the 8 billion in the yeah, right way? Exactly. You, you reach a critical mass and that's happening already. Uh, it, it's happening in the youth culture. It's happening through the global internet because the pandemic has allowed everybody suddenly to tune in to the fact that we are one species on one planet and that the crises that are threatening us are increasingly global. So, you know, with, with America's wake up to its history of slavery, you know, a little bit late, but better late than never, is now part of a global movement of waking up to the, the West's uh, implication in slavery and uh, the recognition that slavery has been part of the civilizational story for the last 5,000 years. There's something profoundly sick about the way we've organized civilization. There hasn't really been a non-slave society in the last 5,000 years. So, you know, this is a big wake up. I think um, that in this situation where we globally interconnected instantaneously, uh, where we have access to this big picture history of, of human existence and planet Earth and the extremity of our crisis, these changes can happen very, very quickly. And they work with what we've got. It's not a matter of getting rid of the Constitution of the government of the United States. On the contrary, it's a matter of wherever we have access to what already exists, redirecting it in terms of a new vision and new values, concern for the good of the whole, concern for expansion of awareness, concern for defense protection and-, and We're gonna have to unpack the practical aspects of that. Sorry? In our next discussion, we're gonna have to unpack that. I've got, I've got a bunch of examples. You know, that's the other half of my slideshow, Porto Alegro. Oh, good. So um, there'll be another half, but right uh, now we're out of time. I'm together. And so we'll have to leave, but uh, I'm sorry. but. <laughs> But there's plenty to discuss here in terms of where we go from here and how we do it um, mm -hmm. in detail and with the, the slides you have. And I want to cover that the next time. So <laughs> if you don't mind, we'll have to cut this now, but uh, yeah, okay. we will reschedule uh, to okay. finish or at least go in the direction of wrapping mm -hmm. our arms around it. These are big questions. Thank you so much, Lewis Herman. Thank really you, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it.